There's a great summer season of entertainment on BBC One. Rowan Atkinson would have you believe it's not the World Cup. A new series based on Alan Parker's award-winning American movie. Davis stars in Family Reunion, the story of an elderly spinster's fight to protect her town from commercial development. I turned over this project to you. I told you to make absolutely clear that Aunt Elizabeth was to be kept in the dark. So Chester is behind them all. Great movie stunts. Harrison Ford reveals the work of the stuntmen, in particular the effects in Raiders of the Lost Ark. There's a lot of gritty action in Raiders, but you have to remember, it's only make-believe. A great summer of entertainment on BBC One. On BBC Two in a moment, Tommy Lee Jones stars in part two of the life story of the amazing Howard Hughes. In 20 minutes on BBC One, a spectacular galaxy of American show business personalities are featured in a gala evening at New York's Radio City Music Hall for Night of 100 Stars. Among them, such legendary names as Helen Hayes, Ginger Rogers, Betty Davis and Liza Minnelli. Add to that just about any name from Who's Who and they're almost certain to be there. Night of 100 Stars is at 9.50. It's now 9.30 and time for the main news of the evening with Michael Burke. British forces are pressing on to their main objective, Port Stanley. The capture of Goose Green and Darwin has cleared the way for the British to move on to Port Stanley. With the settlements at Douglas and Teal Inlet also held, the Argentine garrison at Stanley is encircled by land and sea. But in the battle for Goose Green, it's now known 17 British servicemen were killed. And the Pope in Scotland, an historic meeting with the head of the Scottish Church. British forces are closing in on the capital of the Falklands, Port Stanley. They're now within 20 miles of the town where the biggest Argentine garrison is dug in. Those defenders were again heavily bombarded last night by British ships and aircraft as the land forces pushed closer. But the cost in lives is growing. The Ministry of Defence now says 17 British servicemen, not 12 as announced yesterday, died in the recapture of Goose Green and Darwin over the weekend. We don't know yet the number of Argentine dead. We do know the Argentines put up a tough fight and surrendered only when it was clear they were going to lose. Our reporter on the Falklands, Brian Hanrahan, sent this dispatch on the British paratroop and marine victories. The capture of Goose Green and Darwin has cleared the way for the British to move on to Port Stanley. With the settlements at Douglas and Teal Inlet also held, the Argentine garrison at Stanley is encircled by land and sea. The initiative lies with the British. The more than 100 Falkland Islanders who had been kept locked up in a school in Darwin and Goose Green returned to their homes to find they'd been looted during the Argentine occupation. Some of the old people and children there haven't been feeling very well. They've been visited by the newly arrived Commander Land Forces Falkland Islands, General Jeremy Moore. He's promised them help, but all they've asked for so far is a sack of sugar. But the ship's chefs have used their ingenuity and sent them several bundles, tea, coffee, bread rolls, and a few luxuries as well. Now, for the first time, there's been a high-level night bombing raid over San Carlos Bay. It's presumed it was by Canberra's. Some bombs were dropped in a random pattern, but the only casualty reported was a serviceman with a slight cut. The weather here has now turned much colder, with a raw southerly wind blowing up from the Antarctic and snow lying in the folds of the hills. Some 1,400 Argentines were taken prisoner at Goose Green and Darwin, and they're presenting a bit of a problem. Helicopters, when available, are flying them back to San Carlos Bay, where they're being taken temporarily on board a landing craft after careful checking. One at a time, they're brought forward to be stripped and searched, standing on a paper sack to ease the chill of the metal deck. They seemed well enough clad, although some had holes in their boots, but most were young and painfully thin. One told his captors that all he'd had to eat in two days was a cup of rice. Their possessions, apart from their clothes, are taken away and signed for. Even their bootlaces are removed. 
It seems harsh, but the procedure is exactly as laid down by the Geneva Convention. The military police who have taken charge of the prisoners have copies available in English and Spanish. After that, each man is labelled. The only labels available in quantity are brightly coloured baggage tags from a P&O cruise. Then they're released into the hold where they spend the night. And a cold and uncomfortable night it's going to be, sleeping on a metal deck normally used for stores, trying to avoid the damp patches on the floor. Those still ashore are sleeping in sheep pens. More than 100 Argentine troops are reported to have been wounded in the battle for Darwin and Goose Green. They've been treated at a field hospital and are being transferred to the hospital ship Uganda as quickly as possible. Argentine air attacks on the beachhead have eased off, and I asked Brian Hanrahan if this might indicate a change of tactics. I think the Argentine Air Force has finally run out of pilots uh, who were unaware of what was waiting for them. One of the pilots who was shot down over here said that he'd been told not to expect much in the way of, of fire, and he was astonished at the, the barrage of, of every different sort of fire that greeted him as he came over the hill. Uh, he was brought in from another base. Clearly by now I think word has spread around, and the pilots know what, they, what is waiting for them, and it is no longer feasible to order them effectively to make suicide raids on a British fleet. So there has been a change of tactics. There's also been uh, what the warning is to watch out for desperate measures. We had last night for the first time a high-level night bombing raid. Now that's not very accurate, but it can be dangerous if a bomb happens to land on you or near you. Uh, the chances that it will, the chances it will hit anything it's aimed at, are remote. But it's still a danger, and that's obviously what they're turning to. There have also been totally unorthodox uh, raids. In one, a Hercules transport plane came over a ship, opened its back doors through which... Uh, lorries and things are normally driven up and threw bombs out. I mean, it didn't do any any damage, but it shows the sort of uh, measures to which the Argentine forces are resorting. Literally, a man picked up a bomb and threw it out the door and tried to hit a ship with it. He missed, but he might have hit. It's clear that with the British now somewhere on high ground within 20 miles of Port Stanley, the Argentine garrison are about to find themselves under a new threat, artillery fire. The British 105mm light gun has a range of just over 10 miles. It can be lifted onto a hilltop by helicopter, and this template shows the maximum distance it can reach. As the Argentines are pushed off the outlying hills, so more of the defenders will come within artillery range. Add to that the bombardment by warships standing offshore and attack by RAF Harriers, and the scale of General Menendez's problems become clear. There's no doubt the British Land Forces commander, General Jeremy Moore, would prefer to avoid any further bloodshed. If that means a dignified surrender on the lines of the one at Goose Green, with Argentine troops parading, then singing their national anthem before laying down their arms, that would be more than acceptable to Britain. A lot depends on the state of the Argentine garrison supplies, particularly fuel and ammunition. If they're low, General Menendez may decide to capitulate to avoid further loss of lives. Within the task force, there's some concern that premature release of details about military operations by sources in London could jeopardise chances of success. The attack on Goose Green was reported before it took place. The BBC is fully aware of the risk of broadcasting information which could be helpful to an enemy. That awareness was at its most acute in the external services with their worldwide broadcast capability. And there's bitterness amongst troops over the decision to bury the paratroopers killed in that battle in a mass grave at Goose Green. Their comrades are arguing that the government should bring the bodies home so that families can visit the graves. It was an argument heard during other campaigns, notably Cyprus and Aden, but this time there are signs the Defence Ministry may be under pressure to change the policy of burying British dead where they fall. Despite emphatic denials from the Ministry of Defence that the carrier Invincible was hit yesterday by Argentine planes, the authorities in Buenos Aires have persisted with the story all day. First came several unofficial accounts claiming Invincible had been severely damaged. Then, this afternoon, Brigadier Lamy Dozo, the head of the Argentine Air Force, made a similar claim, although he didn't specify which ship. From Buenos Aires, Brian Walker. Despite denials at the highest level in London, Brigadier Lamy Dozo, who's also a member of the three-man ruling junta, was prepared to commit his personal prestige to the Argentine version of the attack on the task force. In a television interview shown here late this afternoon, the Brigadier repeated the claim that an Exocet missile had struck an unnamed British aircraft carrier and a huge pall of smoke and flames had been seen by Skyhawk pilots who bombed it later. 
The brigadier said he wasn't certain whether it was Hermes or Invincible that had been struck, but confirmation wasn't a problem as the Air Force were encountering little difficulty in operating in the combat zone. It's interesting to note that Lamy Dozu is prepared to back what in London is seen as a straight lie, or at best a serious piece of Argentine over-optimism. The whole scare could be an attempt to whip up Argentine patriotic fervor in favor of the armed forces whom everyone here knows are about to enter the decisive phase of the battle for the Falklands. The leader of the opposition, Michael Foote, has again urged Britain to negotiate the future of the Falklands. He said if Britain departed from its commitment to talks, we would be in breach of the United Nations Charter and lose the support of other countries. Mr Foote referred to a Times report that the government itself was divided, with the Foreign Secretary, Francis Pym, committed to negotiation, but Mrs Thatcher wanting a military solution. Here's Keith Graves, our diplomatic correspondent. Before the British task force set foot on the islands ten days ago, the Argentines could have possessed them legally in a matter of months. But now that set of proposals is no longer on the table and the inner cabinet is divided on what to do when they are back in British hands. There can now be no question of the islands being handed over to Argentina in the foreseeable future and certainly not to the present military junta. One Whitehall source put it this way, there are a number of widows and orphans, there will undoubtedly be more. If they were to see the Argentine flag flying in a year or two, they would ask, quite rightly, why did our men die? Mr Pym favours handing over eventually to some form of United Nations trusteeship. Mrs Thatcher wants to send the governor back and return things to their former position. But that would involve a considerable military presence on, around and above the islands to keep the Argentines away. Mrs Thatcher will already have to explain to her NATO allies when they meet in Bonn next week how she intends meeting Britain's NATO commitments with so many men and machines in the South Atlantic. Under Mr Pym's plan, the Argentines would find it difficult to carry on a war of attrition if a UN force was in place. A compromise is a possibility, a return to British administration for a period while the islanders can be canvassed about their thoughts for the future, and then some form of United Nations presence on the islands. The Pope, after his historic visit to Canterbury on Saturday, has tonight been having talks with the moderator of the Church of Scotland, the Right Reverend John McIntyre. Their meeting in Edinburgh's Assembly Hall was brief, but both men pledged to work for closer dialogue. As the Pope arrived, there were clashes outside the hall between police and Protestant demonstrators, among them the Reverend Ian Paisley. There were ten arrests. During his flight to Scotland, Pope John Paul confessed that he'd not seen much of the wide television coverage of his visit. I must, I must do my, my work the whole day. I, 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 I don't have time to, to follow the television. We'll get a tele-recording of it all someday, oh, Paul Innes. I think we can do that. You. Thank you. The Pope was looking tired when he arrived, but not too weary to kiss the green grass of Scotland, needing no reminder that this was another country with its own history. After all, Bonnie Prince Charlie's mother was a Polish princess. He was given purple heather for luck, but this was to be the last moment of tranquility in a strenuous day which was to end in protest and arrests. The theme of this day was to be youth, and there were certainly plenty of them waiting for him at Murrayfield. 40,000 young Scots, whose cheering completely drowned out the pipe band. Even when they're beating England at rugby five minutes from time, Scots rarely make this degree of noise. The band was playing Scotland the Brave, but they sang, he's got the whole world in his hands, and called out his name as if he was wearing a Scotland shirt instead of the tailored white soutane. Dear young people of Scotland. Several times he halted his address because the cheering made it impossible for him to go on. I take leave of you, happy. Oh. He even started singing along with them to the delight of bishops, boy scouts and bandsmen alike.
Then it was a motorcade along Prince's Street, the outriders staying close to him. The reason wasn't far away. Police were having to restrain a group of militant Protestants who were booing, shouting and throwing missiles outside New College, where the Pope was to meet the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, Dr. McIntyre, in the shadow of the statue of John Knox. John Paul II. The moderator spoke of dialogue, but outside, the arrests were already beginning. Ian Paisley was singing a hymn while his supporters were scuffling with the police. The arrests were inevitable. The Pope left at speed, the boos of the protesters being drowned by cheers, but nevertheless marring the end of a triumphal day for Pope John Paul II. That report from Michael Cole. The Pope's day had started with two meetings in England. In York, he spoke to thousands of family groups about the negative phenomena he said were undermining the strength and stability of marriage. And he urged them to fight destructive forces such as abortion and contraception. The meeting came after a mass celebrated in Manchester on a hillside in Heaton Park. The Pope was in Lancashire and the welcome was homely. Security was as tight as anywhere so far, but there's no keeping the man and his followers apart. The highlight of the Heaton Park Mass was to be the ordination of 12 young men into the priesthood. There were 200,000, well short of the million expected, to hear the Pope's advice to the young ordinands. It sets you apart from the world so that you may be completely dedicated to God. It gives you the mission the Pope's words were translated into sign language for Peter McDonough of Salford, who was born deaf. Prostrating themselves on the podium, the young priests were signifying their commitment to a vocation the Pope said required faith, courage and self-sacrifice. As the Pope's helicopter reached the other side of the Pennines, a crowd of 200,000 had fanned out across the sprawling acres of York Racecourse. Such was the warmth of the welcome that it took the Pope-mobile 30 minutes to pass among the jubilant throng. Taking family life as his theme, the Pope spoke of the positive aspects he'd underlined in a recent apostolic exhortation. Then he turned to matters which he said were causing the church phenomenon. grave concern a corruption of the idea and experience of freedom with consequent self-centeredness in human relations, serious misconceptions regarding the relationship between parents and children, the growing number of divorces, the scourge of abortion, the spread of contraceptive and anti-life mentality. Besides these destructive forces, there are social and economic conditions which affect millions of human beings, undermining the strength and stability of marriage and family life. Thousands of married couples took the opportunity to remember their pledge to love and honor each other. One young couple married last Saturday shared the podium with the Holy Father in this act of reaffirmation. Later, the couple spoke of their moment of embrace with the Pope. The words can't describe it, it's just... Oh, it's disbelief that it's happened. It's, it's, I think it's probably the most memorable uh, start to a, a wedding anyone could possibly have. We were married on Saturday and it's kept going on and on and on and this really crowns everything, I think. President Reagan has announced that the United States and the Soviet Union are to begin strategic arms reduction talks in Geneva on June the 29th. 
The President also confirmed that his administration would abide by the present agreements on strategic weapons so long as the Russians do the same. From Washington, Martin Bell reports. The President made the announcement at Arlington Cemetery on the day when America honours its war dead. After the usual tributes, he turned to his administration's defence and arms control policies in a speech quite clearly adjusted to the politics of his trip to Europe. He promised to listen to America's allies and to work with them, and he said, our understanding must clearly extend to our potential adversaries. Meaning, of course, the Soviet Union and his future dealings with them. This is a fitting occasion to announce that start as we call it, strategic arms reductions. That the negotiations between our country and the Soviet Union will begin on the 29th of June. President Reagan's audience at this national patriotic occasion was the servicemen, veterans and their families gathered in the Arlington. After the usual tributes, he turned to his administration's defense and arms control policies in a speech quite clearly adjusted to the politics of his trip to Europe. He promised to listen to America's allies and to work with them, and he said, our understanding must clearly extend to our potential adversaries. Meaning, of course, the Soviet Union and his future dealings with them. This is a fitting occasion to announce that start, as we call it, strategic arms reductions. That the negotiations between our country and the Soviet Union will begin on the 29th of June. President Reagan's audience at this national patriotic occasion was the servicemen, veterans and their families gathered in the Arlington Amphitheatre. But it was a speech also directed at a wider audience, in Western Europe particularly, and intended to show the President to them in the role of a friend of the Alliance and a spokesman for peace. There are deep concerns in the White House that what should be an easy popularity-building trip for the President may be soured by the anti-nuclear movement in Europe, by suspicions of United States defense policy, by existing strains within the alliance, and, of course, by the Falkland Islands War. United States' support of Great Britain is so soft-spoken that it hardly shows, yet is inflaming and alienating Washington's friends in Latin America. Clearly, there is plenty to be asking the President on the eve of his departure for Europe, and I and my colleagues from French, West German and Italian television will have an opportunity to ask some of those questions tomorrow night in the library of the White House in an interview to be shown tomorrow in an extended edition of the 9 o'clock news. And on this bank holiday, attention has again been on the Falklands where British troops are continuing their drive towards Port Stanley. The Argentines will soon be within artillery range. And in the fighting for Goose Green, the casualty list has risen to 17 British servicemen killed. Well, that's all from me for the moment. There's a Newsnight special on BBC Two at five past eleven, and our late news summary on one is at ten to midnight. Good evening. Well, the weather isn't going to change very much in the next few days. We're going to keep this very hot and humid weather with us. But on the whole, it's going to be mostly dry because we're going to have this area of high pressure um, close to us over eastern areas there. And it's going to keep these low pressure areas and fronts at bay for the time being anyway. But our immediate problem is thunderstorms over England at the moment. They're fairly scattered, though. They're brought about by the very high temperatures uh, achieved this afternoon and the moist air coming up from over France. Now, those thunderstorms should die out later on tonight, and also this front is going to be clearing northeastern parts uh, during tomorrow morning, taking the last of its cloud and rain away with it. So let's have a look at tonight's weather first. And we've got uh, scattered thunderstorms over England at the moment, but they should be dying out during the course of the night. And that area of rain, and light rain mainly, over Scotland is going to be clearing away northeastwards. And then tomorrow, well, starting off pretty cloudy in the extreme northeast there, with still a few spots of rain about, but bright weather will be spreading across from the west. There may be a few light showers, particularly in the western hours and some parts of Northern Ireland, but for the bulk of the country it's going to be another dry, quite hot day with temperatures nearing the 80s. And the outlook, very similar, quite hot and humid. That's it. The BBC's Natural History Unit is 25 years old this week, and in celebration on Wednesday evening at 7.45, there's a wildlife jubilee spectacular introduced by Peter Fiddick. 
a view of the world known to no other generation has been given to us all in the television age. Just one wildlife series, Life on Earth, has been seen by 20 million viewers in Britain alone, and our guides on such safaris were among television's first celebrities. When years ago Lottie joined me for the first time on an expedition, I told her, from now on, you are a man. Oh dear, I think he knows I've pinched one of his apples. Won't be a minute. Now, let's see, bunch of carrots. I've never known anyone take such a time in all my life. As soon as you have them in the hand, they blow themselves up, uh, inflate themselves to look as formidable and massive as possible, and in fact, look rather ridiculous. A week passed without our seeing any sign of leopard. Then one day, we saw in one of the trees a leopard watching us. Wildlife Jubilee is celebrated in a special program this Wednesday at 7.45 on BBC One. Our holiday programmes on BBC One continue now with a visit to Radio City Music Hall in New York, which recently hosted a gala fundraising evening with a night of 100 stars. Thank <laughs> you.